Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel. I do have a new topic for today. <clears throat> Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance for, for you, Hashem. This is the continuation of the Mesilas Yesharim, which is the way of the upright, or also called Path of the Just, by the Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Litzato. And this is from the Art School Yaf edition. This is what the Sefer looks like if you've never seen it. And I will have a link below to Art School. Still in chapter uh, 11, this is part 49. Um, today, I will be finishing up the section that is called, still in chapter 11, for all, um, Nikias in matters relating to human interaction. And Nikias, remember, is explained in English as cleanliness. So this one is called Nikias from Chilol Hashem. And uh, he, uh, so he says, the offshoots of the sin of Chilol Hashem, which means desecrating the name of Hashem, are also numerous and of great import. For a person has to care very much about the honor of his creator. And in all that he does, he must look ahead intently and contemplate thoroughly the possible consequences of his action to ensure that it should not have any result that can become a desecration to the divine name, God forbid. In this vein, we have in fact learned in the Mishnah Avos 4.4, both an unintentional sinner and an intentional sinner are alike, alike, I should say, with regard to Chil Hashem. So the commentary here says, this does not mean that they receive the same punishment. For Hashem's ways are just. Rather, it means that whatever divine punishment each of them receives, appropriate to his situation, will be meted out to him publicly, as stated earlier in that Mishnah. Unintentionally refers to a situation where the sin was not intended but could have been avoided if the person had exercised greater care or foresight. One who caused the Chil Hashem by acting with insufficient foresight must bear the consequences of that action publicly, on his level, just like one who intentionally created Chil Hashem must bear the consequences publicly on his level, as from the Rambam and Rabbeinu Yonah, see Kedushin 48 for additional explanations. So they're saying that the two are alike, with regard to Chil Hashem, but their punishment is different because one was intentional and one was unintentional. Okay, and the, the commentary still continues. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, since everything in the world was created for Hashem's glory, Yeshaya 43.7 and Avos 6.10, it is, it is man's mission in life to utilize every opportunity to enhance his glory through Kiddush Hashem, which means sanctifying the name, and surely to avoid detracting from it through Chil Hashem, Shishari 2.3.148. Thus, even unintentionally causing a chil Hashem by not being sufficiently cautious is a major failure in one's mission. That is why the unintentional sinner is equated here with the intentional sinner. That also says Simat Nas Um Okay, so continuing on, he says, the extent of what can constitute chil Hashem. Regarding the d degree to which one must beware of desecrating the name, the sages of blessed memories have said in Yoma 86a, what is considered chil Hashem? Rav said, if someone like me would take meat from a butcher and not pay for it promptly. And Rav Yochanan said, if someone like me would go four amos without studying Torah, without wearing tefillin. The idea behind this Gemara is that every person according to his spiritual level and according to how highly he is regarded in the eyes of his contemporaries must see to it that he does not do anything inappropriate for a man of his stature. So they're saying, and this is me saying this, so it depends on who you are. That's how it's equated as far as what is Chil Hashem. Um, okay, so he continues on. For in proportion to his heightened importance in the eyes of people and his heightened wisdom, so does it behoove him to heighten his vigilance in matters of divine service and his exactitude about it. And should he not do so, the divine name will be desecrated through him, God forbid. For it is the honor of the Torah that one who increases his study of it uh, most similarly increases his uprightness and the improvement of his character traits. And any deficiency in this matter by one who increases his Torah study causes disgrace to the study of Torah itself. This, God forbid, is a desecration of Hashem's name, blessed be he. For he gives us his holy Torah, and he commanded us to occupy ourselves with learning it, to attain our perfection through it. And if a Torah scholar does not exhibit exemplary behavior, it reflects poorly on the ability of the Torah to perfect a person. Thus, Nikias in regard to Chil Hashem, demands that one always comport himself in a manner befitting a person of his stature. Commentary here says, Since this sin is by definition dependent on the perception of onlookers, a person must act according to the level that people think he occupies, and not his actual spiritual level. As such, one must be intimately aware of how he is perceived, 
and not hide behind a curtain of humility, saying, what difference do my actions make? I am insignificant. That's Rabbi Cheskel Sarna, Iyunim, and Matnas Halpel, and Ma'ar Mesila. Hamesila. In addition, as is clear from the example side by Ramchal, a person can be guilty of Chil Hashem even if he does something that is halachically permissible, as long as others think that he is doing something improper. This point is stressed by the Rambam, Sefer HaMitzvah's Lo Sa'aset 63, and Sefer Achinach 295. Consequently, Rav stated that buying on credit and failing to pay promptly would constitute a Chil Hashem for him, even though it would be acceptable behavior for others. The Gemara limits this to a place where a customer is expected to pay his bills without the storekeeper demanding it. In such a place, people might suspect Rav of cheating the merchant and learning to take such conducts lightly. That's Rashi. And a continual commentary says, Any misdeeds of an observant Jew, especially public failings, are taken as a reflection upon all observant Jews and are a desecration of the name. Moreover, Rav Shlomo Walby in Ali Shur, volume 1, page 49, notes that all people, even those who are irreligious, expect a Torah scholar to be a model of exemplary behavior. Some critics, therefore, subject uh, yeshiva students to scrutiny and wait eagerly to pounce on their missteps. He writes that every yeshiva student must be aware of this and that concern for Chil Hashem should govern his every move, wherever he may be. See also Matna Schelko. And then Rav Eliyahu El Eli El Eliezer Dessler would instruct his students to actually seek out opportunities for Kiddush Hashem. When he lived in London, the fare on the double decker buses was collected by conductors who made the rounds of the passengers. If one sat on the upper deck and the journey was short, he might arrive at his destination before the conductor collected his fare. Rav Dessler told his student to deliberately go through the upper deck and upon reaching his destination, he, would, he should approach a nearby passenger and in a voice loud enough to be heard all around, ask him to please pay his fare to the conductor. This way, the integrity of the obviously religious student will be noticed by all the bus drivers. That's from Rav Dessler, page 154. So what they're saying here is that the uh, someone who's a Torah scholar, he's looked at upon on a higher level. So... Even to the irreligious people, you know, they look at them with a fine tooth comb, so to speak, and like he says, they want to pounce on them as soon as they see something they do wrong, like today they do that. So, and then Rav Desser made the same example with his student, like, pay them fair anyway, give it to someone else if you can't give it. Okay, so now that that is the end of this one on Chil Hashem, now he continues on with Nikias in Shabbos or Shabbat observance. And this is going to be a few more pages, so. So meticulous observance of the laws of Shabbos and Yom Tov is also a major challenge. For the laws are very numerous, and so did the sages say in Shabbos 12a. There are many laws concerning Shabbos. Um, okay, so I need to go back because there is commentary on just the title of Nikias and Shabbos observance, so I don't want to miss that. So um, uh, so the commentary here, here says, It is unclear why Ramchal chooses to discuss this topic at this point in the chapter where he has been discussing sins that arise through interactions between people. Perhaps it is simply because this is the end of the section dealing with sins committed through actions. So that's what we were talking about. But the next section of the chapter deals with the kiss and character traits. So that's just to clarify why they why that, that was there. Okay, so now talking about the, uh, that there are many laws. So uh, the Ramchal's interpretation of the Gemara's words according accords with the Tur or Chaim at the beginning of 301 um, and Rashi. Okay, so that's just a short little commentary on that. Now, continuing on, he says, even matters that are rabbinic prohibitions, uh, i.e. safeguards in instituted by the sages, although they originate from the sages and not from biblical law, we know that it's Doraisa and Darabana. Doraisa is Torah, Darabana is from the sages, so if you've heard that term, are fundamentally important laws. As the sages said in Chagiga 16b, never regard a rabbinic prohibition as something insignificant to you, for Samicha is a rabbinic prohibition. Yet the crates of the generation disagreed about it. Okay, so um, so the commentary here says, The Torah commands that when one brings an animal offering to the base of Migdash, the owner should lay his hands on his head and lean on it. This ritual is called semicha, leaning. Nevertheless, there were Talmudic sages who held that although certain private offerings may be brought on Yom Tov, semicha may not be performed. This is as opposed to maybe you're thinking of a different semicha for a rabbi. That's not what they're talking about, just so you know. <laughs> Uh, due to rabbinic prohibition against resting one's weight on a living animal on Shabbos or Yom Tov. The dispute whether or not smicha was per permitted on Yom Tov occupied the greatest sages of Israel for five successive generations of Chagika 16a and b. Although the halacha was ultimately decided in favor of those who commit smicha, the fact that many great scholars held that this biblical requirement is set aside on Yom Tov due to a rabbinic prohibition shows the importance that is attached to rabbinic decree. So here you can see a good example of that. Okay, so continuing on, he says, 
Now, the details of the laws of Shabbos and Yom Tov, with all the ramifications, are clarified by the halakhic decisors in their books and cannot be spelled out here. All these laws are equal regarding our obligation to observe them and regarding the meticulousness necessary to observe them properly. Ramchal focused on one particular facet of Shabbos observance that requires special attention in the quest for Nikias. What is difficult for the masses to observe among the laws of Shabbos and Yom Tov is refraining from occupying themselves with business matters. This is definitely uh, true. I I'm adding that. And from discussing their business dealings. I agree, yes, that's, uh, that's a problem. Unless you're by yourself, then it probably won't happen. However, this prohibition, namely to engage in or discuss business on Shabbos or Yom Tov, is clearly stated, uh, I'm sorry, however, this prohibition, I want to make sure I said it's a prohibition, is clearly stated in the words of the prophet Yeshaya 58.13. If you proclaim the Shabbos a, quote, delight, and the days of Hashem honored, in quotes, and you honor it by not engaging in your own affairs from seeking your own needs or discussing the forbidden, then you will delight in Hashem, etc. The general rule is that with regard to anything that one is prohibited to actually do on Shabbos, he's also prohibited to endeavor toward it, or even to mention it in his speech on Shabbos, and says she Shabbos 150a through b. For this reason, the sages prohibited inspecting one's possessions on Shabbos to ascertain what work they will require the next day, that's from Reuven 38b, or to walk to the gates of the city towards the end of Shabbos, to facilitate leaving the city at night soon after the end of Shabbos to visit a bathhouse or, or the like, the room in 39B, 39A, sorry. And that's called preparing, like for after. I'm just saying that, you know, like you're preparing for after Shabbos or after you, you, can't, you can't do that. Okay, and continuing on, he says, excuse me, they also prohibited saying, I will do such and such a thing tomorrow if the activity is prohibited on Shabbos, or saying tomorrow I'll purchase such and such merchandise. And all similar statements. Nikias demands meticulous observance of these seemingly, quote, minor laws, along with all the other laws of Shabbos and Yom Tov. Having discussed many specific examples of Nikias with respect to sinful actions, Ramchal concludes his discussion of this aspect of the trait. Until here, I have discussed Nikias in regard to a few of the mitzvot, uh, focusing on those details in which we see that people generally stumble. But from these examples, we can derive how to apply the concept of Nikias to the rest of the Torah's prohibitions. For there is no prohibition that does not have numerous offshoots and details, some of which are more severe and some of which are less severe. And one who desires to be a naki, which means uh, completely uh, cleansed of sin, has to be naki, clean in regard to all of them, and pure in regard to all of them. And the sages of blessed memory have already stated in Shir Shirim Rabbah 6.12, regarding the verse, your teeth are like a flock of hues. Why are the warriors of Israel, meaning your teeth, compared to a flock of hues? For the following reason. Just as a U, um, and it's E-W-E, not Y-O-U, in case you're to take it to, to, you didn't understand that I was talking about, uh, it's a flock of uh, this uh, animal. Just as a U is modest, i.e. It its tail covers its private parts, so too were the warriors of Israel modest and principled during the war with Midian, see by Midbar chapter 31, i.e. they did not succumb to the temptations of the promiscuous Midianite woman. Rav Huna said further in the name of Rav Acha, we can infer that not one of the warriors ever put on his head to fill in before his arms fill in. Commentary here says, not only were the Israelite warriors who fought the Midianites pure of significant sins during the war, see above note 38, but none of them had ever committed even a minor sin, such as unintentionally donning his tefillin in the wrong order. Uh, and that's from Hati Rosh to Shira Shirim Rabba 4.5. And additional commentary says, the Torah states in Bamibra 31.49, that the Israelite warriors did not suffer a single casualty in the war with Midian. Now, warriors who went out to battle had to be pure of any sin. An error with respect to putting on tefillin is listed, is so to 44b, as a reason for which a soldier is disqualified from battle. So it must be that they were perfect in this respect. The opposite is also true. One who is meticulous in fulfilling the mitzvah of arm and head tefillin merits great success in battle in accordance with the verse in Devarim 3320, and they will sever quote, the arm together with the head of their foe. That's from Rosh Shilchos Tefillin 15, and also see Anaf Yosef. Okay, so continuing on, he says, uh, for if one of them had ever put the head to fill in on first, Moshe would not have praised them, and they would not have emerged from the war unscathed. The commentary here says, scripture does not explicitly record that Moshe praised the warriors. However, he did accept the gift of gold ornaments that they presented when they returned from the battle. Uh, and so see above note 38, and he placed it in the Ohel Moed, which is the tent of meeting, as remembrance for the people of, of Israel. That's from the Midbar 3154. This, in effect, was the greatest praise they could get, uh, be given. Sorry, that's from Zerah Avraham to Shir Hashirim Rabbah 612, and Anaf Yosef to Shir Hashirim Rabbah 45. Okay, continuing on, almost finished here. 
The sages similarly state in Talmud Yerushalmi, um, and he says this quotation, commentary, he says this quotation is not found in our edition of Yerushalmi, but is cited by Tur Arachayim 51.4 and various other Yishonim. So the sages uh, stated similarly in Talmud Yerushalmi, one who speaks between the blessing of Yishtabach and the blessing of Yotzer Or during the Shachar's prayer has committed a sin, and he returns from the ranks of war on its account. So commentary here says, all sinners, even those who have transgressed only a rabbinic prohibition, were sent home from the front lines, lest their sins cause the army to be unworthy of divine protection, which could result in the death of not only the sinners, but also their fellow soldiers. That's from Sefer Achina 526 and see Mishnah Sota 44a. Yerushalmi states that this applies even to one who speaks between the blessing of Ishtabach and the blessing of Yisrael. So I'm just saying this. So you see how, how uh, strict they were about things, how everything was had to be exact and perfect uh, because they're worried about ha get, having Hashem protect them. So that was very important. Um, and, and finally, it says here, so you have here an indication of how far true precision and Nikias indeed must extend. And I hope and pray that we will all merit to live and see the coming of the Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting Beit HaMegdash. Amen, and thanks for watching.